Hi, and welcome to Matt Holman Talks Mental Health, the podcast where I have the opportunity to sit down and chat to amazing humans about their journeys and their stories with mental health. For this episode, I'm so happy to introduce Emily Nussel to the conversation. Welcome, Emily. Thanks, Matt. It's really lovely to be with you, and thank you for this opportunity. Oh, you're more than welcome. Um, Absolute pleasure. So, as always, just very briefly how we got to this recording, and then I'll let you do a little bit of an introduction to let people know a little bit more about who you are and where you are and so on. Um, Then we'll get into the big conversation around your story. I want you to share your story with everybody else. Um, But as always, um, just how we got to this uh, recording, uh, Emily and I have been connected through social media for a while now, in particular with LinkedIn. A lot of my connections come through LinkedIn. Um, We've been in messaging and just sort of, I know, following content and so on. So it's just nice to sort of have the chance to sit down and learn a little bit more about you Emily of course um tell your story and, and to hear more about that so it was perfect as I start launching new episodes of this podcast you reached in and said I wouldn't mind having a go and that's brilliant so here we are we're making this episode today with you to tell your story so tell people a little bit about yourself um who you are and what you do yeah um so I live in Guernsey in the Channel Islands which is beautiful most of the time um and I am, so, oh, crikey, I do quite a lot, actually. I work with lived experience in Guernsey's Health and Social Care Service. So it's a brand new role that came into force in January this year. So I'm responsible for delivering training uh, with the Autism, Disability, Mental Health and Eating Disorder team. Um, so I oversee interviews, sort of interview panels. I oversee new project developments. I train staff to make services more adaptable to people with eating disorders, mental health, neurodiversity and comorbidities. Um, I share my story at conferences and events within the service and equip professionals with lived experience learning. Um, And that leads me to like a lot of volunteering as well. So I coach people with disabilities through sports and educate school children to understand disability and work with inclusion and acceptance and understanding. And I do a lot of media work with Beat, Mind and Action for Children, sharing my story, sharing what works with my recovery and my journey and just equipping the community really through signposting and support and, you know, empowering other people to feel empowered and, you know, grow in their lives and be the best they can be. Wow. That's amazing. I mean, I'm inspired by you already. It's incredible to hear all the things that you're involved with and all the organizations you're involved with as well. And, and, you know, you touched on some really important things for me in my world. And, you know, I've shared a lot with the public, you know, mm-hmm. in the public space around, you know, neurodiversity and eating and stuff. So, so thank you for, for everything you're doing to help support professionals and all the people that you're supporting. Firstly, I just want to say that out loud um, for you, Emily. So thank you. Um, but you have a story. There's a reason why you do everything you do. And lived experience is part of that, of course. You did mention that. So I'm going to throw that to you just to say, tell us all the story. Let us know a little bit more about what's your journey look like with mental health and neurodiversity, because I'm, I want to hear more. Yeah, um, so my mental health journey goes back, oh my goodness, to 2005. That's a bit scary. Um, so for me, I... Um, I really struggled growing up. So I was born with a physical disability. Um, So I was a premature baby. I arrived eight weeks early. My mum said I was determined and impatient to get into this world and raring to go. Um, So kind of from a young age, I really struggled because, you know, cerebral palsy, for people that don't know, it's a, um, a lack of oxygen to the brain, either during birth or just after birth, which affects your physical development psychological development and some people it affects intellectual development and I was fortunate that I was only physically impacted but intellectually I was you know the strongest I could be which I was grateful for so really from a young age I was um you know because of that intellectual development not being impacted I was in the mainstream society as we call it mainstream education sort of mainstream services people just sort of physical problem and didn't think anything was wrong with me so sadly I was more of a target for bullying and a lot of people, you know, because they could see me using crutches, sticks, or at times a wheelchair, they saw plaster casts, they saw splints. That would be, because I guess they didn't have the awareness and understanding, that would be a target for name calling. And that really kind of shattered my confidence and my self-worth, my self-esteem. And, you know, from a young age, my father and my mother split up when I was three. So, you know, kind of my father figure that I looked up to walked out of my life and, you know, I had to adapt to my mum having a new partner, my father remarrying, which was a very, you know, awful time. And I just didn't kind of really know my place in the world. And so I really struggled to communicate that as a young person. And, you know, I wasn't given those skills growing up. So for me, it was almost like I started to mask from a very young age. And 
it would just come out in outbursts, anger. I tell people I was fine, but actually under fine was really not what I was. You know, I wasn't fine. And that's kind of where that struggle began that, you know, for so many years I got away with telling people I was fine. But actually in 2008, I was, you know, admitted to my children's ward for medical reasons, but actually they realised that there were further issues because I'd become completely disengaged, shut down. I was withdrawing. I was, you know, in the words of a social worker, going off the rails. Mm. Um, you know, I was struggling to be in school and I was, you know, really angry towards myself. And that affected my relationship with food. It started a struggle with self-harm. And in the end, that kind of led to a diagnosis of an eating disorder and a struggle with self-harm and depression and anxiety. And then later on, this led to an autism diagnosis, which didn't really get picked up on sadly um through children's services so I had eating disorder treatment I was off island a couple of times in inpatient treatment facilities and when I came back you know again I just had community eating disorder mental health treatment but it wasn't really adapted to my needs you know they supported me in the best way they could but because they weren't fully aware of my autism and my other needs it just didn't really it worked at the time as best as it could but it wasn't the best treatment and that kind of meant I really struggled growing up to the age of 18 and you know I really didn't know my place of belonging you know it led to a lot of dark thoughts a lot of scary thoughts and a lot of that I masked because you know physically people could see there were problems with my physical health but psychologically that impact of big life experiences and those disabilities and you know the abuse and trauma I would just mask and have that physical thing to kind of go to and not show other people because of that shame and fear. Wow. Well, wow. it's a lot you were going through in those moments, right? And so where did it go next? How did things start to change for you or where did it go to next? Yeah, so actually it really started to change in 2012, which okay. feels like a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Um, so I am. Um, I was I was actually referred to Action for Children um, because, you know, over the years, the fam- with my father walking out and, um, you know, he had shared custody and unfortunately it was like a really difficult court case and it was, you know, deciding where I was living half the week and who I would be with was a really stressful experience and it meant that a lot of my relationships broke down and I really, really struggled mentally and I was struggling at home. I'd just come out of, you know, a long inpatient admission and... I really didn't kind of know where I was in the world. And I went to a charity, a local charity for some support. And I met with a lovely person there and she was phenomenal. And she then said to me, I want to refer you to a local charity called Action for Children. And I'm going to signpost you also to Beat the Eating Disorder Charity and Mind. And actually that's kind of where that began the understanding because, you know, the charities are phenomenal. You know, they have all these wonderful people and, you know, they really just kind of started to hear me as a person and work with me. You know, they had the helplines, they had their emails, they had their groups, they had parenting support, and that was so important for me. Yeah, no, of course, and and I'm I'm really glad that that person was able to to give you sort of the the support and the encouragement to reach into those charities. And you're absolutely right; they're they're amazing organisations. And I know you mentioned in your introduction that you do volunteering and you work with those people as well. You know, you do work with them as well. So so kudos to you, amazing. Um, I do want to ask a little bit about the autism element, if that's okay. It's something that it's you now becoming much more. There's much more awareness now around neurodiversity. Of course, the conversation is growing yeah. across society. Um, we did have a pre- talk a little bit about ADHD as well and you know talking about those sort of concepts or those those challenges that people are living through when you were aware that autism was in the frame what did that do for you how did that help or maybe not but but how how did that come about and and sort of what was the the feeling after yes initially came about when I was around 13 uh, which is a long time ago now um (laughs) and it was actually the paediatrician. So because of having my physical disability, you know, they were always in touch with me, making sure I was as physically well as possible. And they worked really closely with the CAMS team, the eating disorder team and all these other teams. And, you know, there was just certain events in life where I wasn't like the Emily that people knew. I was just this really angry, distressed young lady and I couldn't process emotions. I couldn't interpret things like noise, social events, social interaction. I just really couldn't engage with and I was quite shut down and quite 
you know, and they, and they put it down to trauma as well. But then actually they, the paediatrician said, came in, I just remember this, she walked in with another load of folders, sat down in her office, looked at me and my mum and said, we've had a chat at a meeting, we want to do an autism assessment. And I just remember looking at my mum thinking another blinking assessment in polite words. Yep. Um, and I just thought, you know, I didn't want to go through it all again. I was like another assessment, another person to sit and look at me and make these judgments and these assumptions. Yeah. But actually at the time, you know, they did pick up onto the psychologist sat in, this paediatrician sat in and this autism team sat in and they, they did these assessments and it came back. At actually, yes, she does have autism. And we were like, okay. So we waited a few months after the assessments to get that result. And they said it said autism on the thing. So then CAMS and the eating disorder team kind of went, oh, yeah, she's got autism. But nothing really followed for me. They were like, oh, okay, she's got autism, but that won't change the treatment we give her in the eating disorder service or the mental health service. And then I just, you know, they said, oh, she's not engaging. She doesn't want to get better. But actually having an autism diagnosis, you don't understand the normal kind of treatments for people that don't have autism that do engage in those treatments. And I wanted to engage, but my brain just couldn't engage in the same way as somebody that didn't have that experience. And so that was a really difficult sort of like navigation to get through, and especially till I was sort of 18 and trying to then navigate adult services. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And and I can absolutely understand and empathize with that. And, you know, in getting the autism diagnosis at 13, you know, a lot of people don't get diagnosed until much later. And now it's still mm-hmm. a, a challenge, isn't it? That that, you know, the mental illness tends to be the, the thing that is the focal point. And then mm-hmm. afterwards, there's these thoughts of, oh, maybe something else is going on or maybe else, you know, in, in personal experience, know exactly how that looks from being going through that with my own daughter as well. So, you know. I think it's it's incredible that you've you've taken everything that's come been thrown at you and and you've progressed your life and and where you are and and so so sort of the last few years then how so so just a quick question because obviously covid came and it was a a period in time where things were changing <laughs> how did you manage your way yeah. through those covid times it was really difficult because i think for me so living on an island is beautiful you know we've got the beach on the doorstep we've got the sea we've got so much to be grateful for but honestly it was awful because it was like living in no man's land literally everything just grinded to a halt and I I live right near the local airport and I'm so used to planes coming over me every 20 minutes and there was just this earring silence um there was just you know because I live in semi-assisted living so kind of when I went through adult services I spent sort of two and a half years in inpatient treatment and yeah. uh, day patient treatment and then outpatient for my eating disorder and all the other mental health and all the other things that happened with that and um, it was then decided that I would move into a semi-assisted accommodation because I needed support physically and just to keep me well as well as possible mentally so you know they have to take those precautions that you know when COVID hit our building they literally just said no one can leave no one can come out their doors the staff were dressed like robots and it just it was really overwhelming and having autism it was just like my routine I am so so needed for routine like I have vision boards with my schedule every week I have sticky labels I have diaries I have vision planners and if if something changes without warning it can be quite overwhelming so it was really really kind of but then like phenomenal you know it's part of my autism because nothing was done in children's in adults I got reassessed again um because some events some really difficult events happened and very out of character for me so they said actually this isn't normal for what happened to me and they were like there's something else we need to reassess and see where we're at with this autism diagnosis because nothing really wasn't done about it and actually it all linked into those events that actually autism played a massive part in that and so I think for that, you know, I was then referred to an autism service that deals with eating disorders, mental health, yep. all under one roof. And I work for the service now as well, as well yep. as having the support. And it was actually that was really important because they came in in lockdown and were like, right, you know, we can do teams calls with you. We can do action planning. We can okay. have virtual death check ins daily. And that was, I think, my lifeline because I was, you know, a lot of trauma resurfaced from my childhood in lockdown and I was, you know, close to an inpatient admission um, because of what it led to. But, you know, those people just rallied around me and said, we've got you. And, you know, the charities like Samaritans and B and Mind, they were just phenomenal because, you know, they were there as the outsider looking in. You know, they weren't there to judge me. They weren't there to tell me what to do. They were there to just listen and guide me. And sometimes that's all people need just to feel heard, which is so important. 
Oh, and I I totally agree with you. And I think that from experience of, you know, supporting people who are going through challenges in their lives, you know, being heard is the first piece, isn't it? You know, mm. people want to say what's going on if they feel safe to do so. And and but you need to know that somebody's listening to what you're saying. And and it's honestly your words, your wor- words ring so true to my world. And I think that's what a lot of people would would also share in terms of the support that you give now, in terms of the work that you do now, you're obviously trying to raise awareness or, or at least, you know, support people through that. What sort of stuff, you know, have you found over the last because you how, how long have you been in this role now? It's quite re- relatively new, isn't it? Yeah. So the role last year i got offered the job in sort of october last year yeah. and unfortunately uh, life experiences and unpredictable life events and everything else with it kind of hit me all at once um things sadly went downhill quite quickly for me mentally and physically right. so my manager was phenomenal she just said you know and i was still studying and she was like do you know what you just need three months out yeah. i said yeah I said, give me three months. I said, let's see what January looks like. And then in January, you know, after my exams, things were picking up slowly. So we were like, let's start you in. And it's a brilliant job because it's zero hours. Right. And if I'm having a really rough week, I'll just be like, pass it on to somebody else in team this week and I'll come back next week. Yeah. Or if I'm up for it, I'm like, pass me the work. Let's do this. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's, they really look out for you because it's so important because when you're sharing a lived experience, it's empowering but it can be really exhausting as well if it's all of the time if it's every day you know hours on end and that can be quite a lot for one person to take in in one day and especially being autistic you know it's like wow my buckets I call it the overwhelm bucket if it gets really full people will just see a meltdown and it is you know it's not great it is really distressing it can be quite overwhelming and but we visualize that bucket in therapy so I actually a lot of my therapy we visualize what's going on in my brain we draw things we draw analogies we draw pictures and we write words, we draw cartoons, you know, and do it in art therapy now. And okay. it just tells stories. And that's sometimes what people need. If they can't engage in everyday eating disorder, mental health treatments, you know, adapt that treatment. And then you're engaging that person and then you feel empowered, which is so important. And that's my job now to do that for people. And how are you finding the reaction from people that you are supporting? Are you supporting the user or are you, you know, the, the service user or are you supporting the families and what is what does that look like? It's a bit of everything, really. So when I started the job, they originally said I'll probably be a bit of training, a bit of interviews. And then I did a bit of work in Mark for the education, you know, education review, adapting the education review and how we engage children from a young age that got autism to manage in school, you know, building sensory rooms and how we engage them through creativities and alternative ways of like teaching and training. So I that was my first kind of thing. And then, um, unfortunately, I wasn't very well, so I took two months out. And then after that, I was working in schools with school nurses, and I was teaching year eights about self-image, well-being, you know, building toolboxes, mental health, eating disorders, and understanding differences. And as part of my coaching that I've done for five years, that was really key to it as well, to work with children to understand differences and embrace those differences. And from that, really, I got contacted by another team within the health and social care services and said, we've got a conference. We need an expert by experience. Do you want to come speak? And I was like, OK. So little did I know there was going to be 300 people in the room, um, half of which have supported me in my eating disorder journey, my mental health journey, social care. And so, you know, I shared a lot of my story. I shared about the importance of collaborative services, how we, you know, when a young person turns 18, how do we make sure that they're not just left to the sidelines, that we bring them back, that we engage services, that they don't have to, you know, in Guernsey, a lot of people leave after three, six months of post. So the post is re-advertised, somebody else has to come in, has to replace that person that maybe they've just built a relationship with. But how do we make sure that that story doesn't have to be shared again if it's too traumatic, that we help them to keep moving forward so my job's about finding new alternative ways to make sure that stays the focus that we engage those people and support those people mm-hmm. and find those new ways to engage them and keep information shared you know I have no idea about technology but it's about how we bring that technology to life you know and share that information and so that you know you know we have those MDT meetings you know so you know in a lot of my inpatient treatment I had MDT people but it's how we do that in services throughout that person's journey how we bring that together and share that information so that their story is only heard once or as many times it needs to be but then it grows on that story and it grows recovery and it's really important because then you empower that person to move forwards and feel heard and feel understood and feel engaged and if they feel engaged they'll want to get better and want the support and move forward with that 
Well, again, I, yeah, I absolutely echo everything you've said. I, I think that's such an important part of it, isn't it? And, you know, having mm. seen it again, you know, personal experience of seeing it firsthand of how many times the story has to be told before people, you know, take notice. And it gets it gets quite tiring and, you know, challenging, doesn't it? Um, and keep on championing it. I'm, I'm intrigued because obviously you're in Guernsey and, you know, I'm over in the mainland in, in England. But in terms of the service, do you feel it is more adaptable in on the island so you're able to make a difference? Or is it just that you work with people all over the UK anyway? So it doesn't really you don't really notice the difference bit of both really so you know the local provision is phenomenal you know the people that do stay that don't leave the service um you know the consistent people they're incredible you know they might move teams they might move but they stay within the health and social care service but actually so that consistency is phenomenal but actually bringing in UK people can be really important because living on an island some of our resources aren't there we don't have every single resource possible because we just don't have the facility we don't have the funding we don't have the staff you know so we have to link up a lot with the UK so like when I went I've been away for eating disorder treatment I went to a service in London back in 2012 and but then actually that consultant comes to Guernsey every three to six months and she'll review me when she's over but she's contactable by phone and email in between and teams and you know being under the autism and eating disorder service you know I did have a lot of changes over the years in between 2018 uh, between sort of 2018 and 2020 I had nine changes and but now this person that started in 2020 he's remained consistent and he's still you know he's actually employing somebody else because his job load's getting getting quite big but he's been my port of call and he's re- because you know and he's remained that content and that is so important for somebody that's autistic or neurodiverse because they need to build trust and with me having trauma growing up and you know living through abuse and family breakdown it takes me a long time to trust people yes. and you know when I've been in inpatient treatment that would be changing all the time it'd be different people different ways of working you know all these experiences that you shouldn't have to experience in sort of those settings like you know they looked after me but all the changes of people all the things that I had to witness actually brought more trauma to me because it was just all this change all the time but actually the community is so important to treatment and support and you keep those people in the community you keep them in their lives and you build up that resilience and that's what is so crucial about these professionals coming in and working with services because they bring new knowledge they bring new ideas and actually with my role it can help to grow those ideas and bring them to life and it's actually really good because professionals can then say actually from your experience did this work or did this not work and it just really helps us to work through that because you can learn from textbooks you can learn from training but actually you learn from the lived experience because they're the people that are going through it and been through it yeah no and I I, and I think you're right and it's that you know you you need to test things but you also need to get feedback on what you're doing and you know unfortunately a lot of the services or the things that happen often don't take into consideration everybody's sort of feedback so it 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 works Mm. for some it doesn't work for everybody and you know these conversations are growing which is good and the awareness of you know, things like autism, ADHD and other neurodiversity is growing and it's great. It's just that not everybody's involved in that conversation yet. So not everybody understands. Yeah. That's why I think this is fascinating listening to you, Emily, because you, you're you sharing such a wonderful perspective of, you know, your experience. And I don't like the thoughts that you've been through, the challenges, but what you're able to then do is use those experiences to show or share for others to understand a little bit more about it, right? Absolutely. And I think it just educates everyone because there's been life experiences I went through back in before. So, cause I had this autism diagnosis in CAMS, but mm-hmm. nothing was really done about it. And then in 2016, when I was in inpatient treatment for my eating disorder and for suicide attempts and self-harm and all these other things, a uh, quite a traumatic event happened. And I found myself, you know, before the criminal justice system and this judge was like, she's n- never been like, like the anger that, had happened in these experiences was the lack of communication from professionals they were just coming in and going we need to give you this hold me down do it freak me out and I would lash out in return yeah. and this judge you know he said ideally you would have to you know, normally he said I'd have to follow the criminal justice and put you through this so, but he said actually you're somebody that's never been through this system and there's something that's and actually after that within action for children we realized that something wasn't quite right and they thought it was trauma related with my trauma but they said we well, need you to be reassessed for autism again so then I had a private assessment with the Cheshire and Wirral partnerships so they came over and they absolutely confirmed the autism diagnosis and said yes this is autism and actually none of, none of those people explained it so then actually I could then go yes it was on a piece of paper at the time but now in the job 
I can say I've got autism, this doesn't work, this works, this is how we need to improve. And now when I have treatment, you know, if I have to get medical treatment or if I'm having mental health treatment, I'm just like, this is how you engage with me. This is how you need to engage with those people. And you need to, it's the communication, you know, now nurse, you know, I have, to, I have physical disabilities. So I do have like unplanned hospital admissions for infections and stuff. And the nurses will come in now and go, we need to do this test. This is what it will look like. This is what it will feel like. Okay. And they'll do an example on like a dummy of like, you know, those dolls that you train on. And then they'll say, can we just tell you what it'll feel like on you? And they'll feel, feel it on like my arm. And if I can cope with that, I'm like, yeah, carry on. And then they'll talk to me throughout the whole process. Whereas before none of that happened, they would just come in, hold you down, do whatever they had to do and walk out because they were so busy. Yeah. But actually stopping and listening to that human being and understanding them and their needs, you then create that interaction, you create that trust and that safety. And then that person engages and that anger is not going to come out, that distress won't come out and they can build that trust and like feel in control, which is so important because a lot of these things, you know, with having an eating disorder, it's a way of finding control it's a way of being in control and that's what it's been for me but if other people help you feel in control that empowers your recovery well I, I find that fascinating yeah absolutely and I totally agree with it and I think that's the that's the missing piece in a lot of respects you know mm. in a mental health you know in a mental health facility the primary focus is on the mental health issue the eating disorder or the you know the the, the mental um, illness that's present and the underlying issues with autism or other neurodiversity is never really or not necessarily understood and, and it is yeah. a tangible feast depending on staffing. And I think you've covered on so many of these critical topics. And I think I'd love to see you talking in a bigger group with the professionals and everybody else, you know, because because I, I just think you've just got such a wonderful um, perspective, you know, and, and that's what this is about. So, you know, I, I'm, yeah, I'm inspired by what you're saying. And I, and I think you're doing an amazing job. We are coming to the end of this conversation because, you know, time is a critical point, of course. Um, but we have a few more minutes. I'm just going to sort of ask you sort of I always ask for sort of a closing thought or somewhere that you think you know the future looks like or what you want to do or a quote or a statement or something um so there you go so let me just pass that package over to you sorry it's not that straightforward <laughs> in simple questions um but what would you like to share with people as the sort of the closing piece to this I think the biggest thing I always kind of share is that don't be afraid to re remove that mask because yes, your mask might be your safety net. You know, it was for me, but actually underneath that mask, you re reveal your vulnerability, your braveness, and you reveal the real you. And there's not a shame in being the real you because we all learn from being broken. We all learn from being vulnerable. And it kind of takes me to one of my greatest things that got me through lockdown was the greatest showman. And the, one of the quotes that goes, I am brave, I am bruised, and I'm who I meant to be, and this is me. Yeah. And that's a really big thing because you are you and you are loved and worthy and enough and embrace that and empower that because by being different, we succeed together. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I, I really do. And I, and I totally get it. And I, I know the, the, the greatest showman very well. Um, having two daughters, musical theater in our house it was a wonderful thing. <laughs> Um, so but you're right. And it, it's so true. Everybody's unique. And I think we just once we embrace the uniqueness of us individually, we can create this wonderful world of awareness and support. And, you know, not everybody's going to join the party, but you know what, let's just get as many people on the boat as we can and, you know, and, and really try and sort of, you know, support each other. And I think that's just an amazing Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. So I, I've loved this conversation. I've loved listening to your story, Emily. I knew I knew I would, but um, you know, as soon as you say out at the beginning about what you were going to cover, it was like, right, those are all topics that check my boxes. I'm like, <laughs> I'm all over these. I really want to help more people. Um, and you are. You are helping lots of people. And I just want to, you know, I, I know I've said a lot of um, positives and, and superlatives, but, but you are genuinely helping a lot of people with the work that you do. I know you are, even mm -hmm. though I've not seen you doing it. I know you will be. And that's amazing. And, and all I can ask for is, you know, I wish we'd met somebody like you many years ago before my daughter went into her challenges with her mm. autism and, and her eating and everything else. And, and and then we could have learned more. And you are obviously a sharer of a wealth of experience and knowledge. And please keep doing that because that's what your purpose is. You have a purpose. Absolutely. And, and you know what you're doing as well is phenomenal because then you're bringing people together and sharing those experiences so thank you because you're doing a fabulous job teamwork makes the dream work right absolutely yeah. Yeah. we can start singing lego songs now um but <laughs> just a huge thank you i hope anybody that's listening has found this useful i know somebody out there will have listened to this or will listen to this and find it really helpful um i'll drop all your details into the post as well so people know where to find you if they wanted to to reach out or if they wanted to ask any questions is that okay you okay with that 
that's absolutely fine. Yeah, I can send you any links that you need. Well, now I know how to do it all. So, yeah. Yeah, now you know how to work the computer. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. excellent stuff. <laughs> Emily, I want to wish you all the very best for the future. Good luck with everything. Thank Enjoy. you so much. Take care and all the other Thank things. You. Enjoy the island. And um, I am a bit envious of it being an island. But, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so look after you and take Definitely. care. Catch up Thank you, you so much. Bye-bye.